Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Self-Publishing Tips and Tricks Show, a series designed to give you insight into the world of self-publishing and marketing your books. I'm Ben Pick, and I'm here with my co-hosts. I'm Morgan Lee. And I'm Shannon, writing under the pen name of SC Houston. We're today with Adrienne Santiago, a newly published author of two multi-genre works. We're going to ask him questions about his self-publishing journey and how he markets his works. But before we jump into the interview, do you all have any points of interest or news or things that you want to talk about? Uh, right now, I am working on a new fantasy series. It's going to be an eight-book, cozy, adult fantasy series. So I'm working on that for Nano right now, and that's going pretty well. And I'm also trying simultaneously to work on the third book in my trilogy that is still slated to come out at the end of this year. So just working on writing those. And for those who don't know what Nano is, for anyone who's heard that term for the first time today, um, it is a short for Nano Remo National Writing Month, National Novel Writing Month, and uh, it is a uh, uh, three three months of the year that lots of writers get together and write as much as they can. So um, we're all trying to work on that. I think uh, this month it's been slow going for me. I know Morgan's got a, a lot more, I think, than we have uh, been able to get done. I don't know. I don't know um, Ben how much you've been able to write. <laughs> Not very much. Yeah, me neither. I think I'm right around 3,000 words for the month. I have to say, I love the idea of a cozy fantasy mystery series, Morgan, but it's like such an opposite thing from dark fantasy. I know. <laughs> it's it, it's so hard for me to write it. I'm like, wow. I, I, I kind of want to take this a little darker. Yes. So it might change. It might not be cozy at the end of it, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I love that you have like, you know, it's going to be eight books long. It's like yeah. really awesome that you know that ahead of time. All right, news for me. My Kickstarter is still going for my fantasy romance, A Curse of Scales and Feathers. It has already fully funded, which uh, has just blown my mind because I, I truly thought I was going to be spending every day trying to like hawk my site and the Kickstarter site. Like, hey, come support me <laughs> every day and making lots of posts everywhere to get people to support it. And it's not only fully funded, it's, it's over double for my goal. And it's just shocked me. If you are following the Kickstarter, then you know that I have weekly goals. I already met one and I have a short little dance video out. I will link that in the show notes in case if you've not seen it, but it is a silly little dance because I'm an awkward dancer. <laughs> the AuthorTube Writing Conference has uh, wrapped up now. You can find more information about the presentations on AuthorTubeWritingConference.com if you want to catch some of those. We had a lot of great presentations. And actually, one of the ones that like shocked people, I could tell by the way they were talking about it, and they were just blown away by it, is a presentation by our speaker today, our author that we're having on today, Adrian Santiago. I don't know if we'll give, have a chance to ask him anything about that because we do have a lot that we want to cover with him because he's been a surprise to me when I've researched his background, what he's accomplished. So uh, yeah, so I'm going to end it there and let uh, Ben take back over. Sure, sure. As for me, it's pretty straightforward. I'm not doing nano. So I'm in editing with my third book and Prepping to send away to a professional editor. So I'll do the first round and then hopefully get it out by sometime spring of next year. That's my goal. We'll see if I can get there. And let's see, this is coming out in a week. So this is really scary. Uh, July 15th. So I'm also prepping for my first book anniversary. My first book, my debut novel, Falling Through, was published on August 6th, a year ago. So I'm planning on doing something fun for that Sunday. Okay. We'll see what I can get done with it. I have a yeah. plan. Anyways, now let's talk about our guest author today. He's got the hair of an A's rock band and the speech pattern of a Ninja Turtle. Adrian Santiago is the author of the Mythic series, which has debuted with Shadow of the Spark, an adult sci-fi fantasy with murder mystery plots and hints thrown in. The series will continue to expand the universe Adrian has created with a trilogy and an open door to more books beyond that. I'm going to just throw in a little bit more here, but he's also created some prequels and some little short stories here and there to expand on his universe. Shadow of the Spark is available wide through his brand of Books by Adrian, an online author platform through which he produces his videos, streams, and podcasts, and publishes his books. His YouTube channel is a stage for authors and creatives of all kinds to showcase their art and tell their stories, while also providing news, promotions, and media content for his own works. Hi, Welcome. everybody. Hey. Hey. Hi. Welcome, Adrian. Thank you. Uh, what a warm welcome, especially all the nice things that Shannon says. I can't wait to, you know, dig into that a little more. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you want to tell us a little more about yourself or anything that we missed? 
Well, what what's funny is that uh, the very powerful SD Houston over here uh, kind of gave me a little nudge to get my uh, my uh, Amazon author page up, and uh, I was kind of forced to write a new bio. So I, I figured that I would just read that to you guys, and you give me your feedback on it. Okay, <laughs> live feedback right here. Yeah, here All we right. go. So it, it goes like this: What do you get when you take a Caribbean islander, add a childhood on the block in Buffalo, New York, mix in some Southern charm with a dash of crazy? Florida, and then shake it all up with punk rock music, comic book nerdery, and a knack for drama. You get a storyteller more akin to a Buddha bowl, a combination of ingredients that may be an acquired taste, but so is fusion jazz. And that's what Adrian Santiago's books are like, a mix of sci-fi, fantasy, crime, drama, thriller, mystery, romance, and spice. His casts are diverse, his worlds are eclectic, and his stories play like movies in your mind's eye. Welcome to Books by Adrian. I love it. Love it. Yes, I like wow. it. So. Yeah. Which um, Martin hated it. <laughs> uh, Martin hates a lot. No, I, I like it. Well, the, here's the important part, and this is something that I had um, made sure I, I hoped I had impressed on you when we were talking through messaging on Discord was that your bio on platforms like Amazon, which is a searchable platform, you want to have keywords in there so mm. that people can find your books from your keywords in your bio. So, nice. which I think you did a really good job of getting those keywords in there that actually talk to what your book is. And um, I know Ben and I, we've read the book. Morgan, I don't know if you've had a chance to read his book yet. Not yet. Mm -hmm. Okay. But what what he said there, while, while he was talking about what do you get with this type of author and you throw in all these different things, I was like, oh, that sounds just like his books. Um, <laughs> I did read the bio yesterday too, but I, I loved hearing it out loud. <laughs> but I was like, yes, it was it was perfect because it does speak to what type of writing Adrian has. That's what I wanted to do. I, you know, a lot of author bios will go the very standard born in such and such a city and move to blah, blah, blah. And I'm just like, I don't want to do that. I just, but I, but I still need to get all that information across at the same time, you know? So like, that's thanks. Yeah, and it certainly stands out. Woo we, we usually like to ask you to tell us about your journey of self publishing your first book, but your journey has been purposely crafted and you have showcased that entire work from start to finish, starting on March 2nd, 2020. So three whole years ago, when you published your first YouTube video, Hey, I'm writing a book. That's where you revealed that you were writing your debut novel. You linked this to launching your author platform. And this is a full three years before you published that same book, which you released on April 30th of this year, 2023. Do you mind telling us about your thought process when you set out to establish your author platform? Like, what motivated you to do it and what other steps you take besides starting your YouTube channel? So before I started writing this novel, which for anyone watching the video version of this looks like this <laughs> for all you audio only listeners, uh, just go to the cover books by Adrian.com. Uh, yeah, it's a, uh, it's a shot of the, the city, very futuristic city, which some kind of psychedelic, uh, you know, gravity defying city work in the middle there that makes you wonder what this world is really like. There's uh, a shot of Gaia, which is a planet, a ringed moonless planet in, above. And the very bottom lets you know that this is a murder mystery because a very creepy dude with blood on his jacket is following a, a lady down the street with nefarious intent. And then the, this uh, on the back, you have my cast of characters. Uh, you have... Uh, the lead detective and and the two side characters that she interacts with throughout the story. So anyway, uh, for those of you audio okay. only listeners, books by Adrian .com, you'll see the, the cover. Go look at it. It's a beautiful cover. Thank you. Yes, I I'm very very proud. Of it. Um, what was I saying? Yes. So before I started writing that novel, I I had tried writing many different things, and I started so many different projects that I very excitedly told friends and family about, and was like, "Oh, this is going to happen," and then none of it would happen. And so when I started writing this one, I definitely wanted to be held accountable, not by my family and friends, but kind of the world. I wanted the whole, you know, to like announce I'm doing a thing, and then actually do it. I was looking through YouTube at other authors who are doing their thing on here. And my story is very similar to a, a lot of people's. They encountered Jenna Moresi, as did I. And uh, she's she's a wonderful door into author two. And, uh, and, and plenty of people have plenty of things to say about her, good, bad, in between, such as fame. But she's a wonderful gateway drug to author two. 
And so that's what she was for me. Part of her story is that she was an accountant or something like that. She worked with with numbers and she hated her job and, and she hated going to work every day and she wanted to write books. So she was like, I'm just going to do it. And she started an, uh, a YouTube channel and it took off and kind of blew up. So by the time her first book came out, she had a huge following that, that was already waiting for it and her sales reflected that. And I said, that's what I want to do. Now, I didn't accomplish anything on, on that scale, but the effect was the same. I, I built an audience over the course of three years while I wrote this thing. And by the time it was done, at least somebody was waiting for it. And more than a few people have bought it. I'm pretty excited about that. And I would say that she came in at a good time in YouTube when AuthorTube was still at its beginning stages. And yeah, she basically it, helped shape it. Yeah, she helped shape it. So th this, you know, a lot of channels that started then that are still going, they're bigger now today than what we could probably accomplish in the same time. She's also the reason why I started my channel the way I did, which was kind of a, a 180 from what she does on her channel. Her channel is very much beginning writers uh, that are starting out. Hey, these are tips and tricks, and these are your top 10 things to do and not to do. And these are the tropes that we love and the tropes that we hate and all that kind of stuff. And that's great. That's great content. I, I love consuming that, but I didn't want to make that. I didn't want to be a how-to channel. So I was like, I'll go the other way. I will be a, sh a showcase channel and I will showcase as many people as possible and I will learn from them because that's what I want to do here. I want to learn as much as, as possible while you know, building as much as I can as well. That was the whole premise behind this podcast. <laughs> Bingo, bango. Great minds think alike. What do you feel has been most successful about taking this purposeful approach to setting up your author platform in advance before releasing your debut? I mean, I certainly learned a lot along the way that helped me finish. I don't know that it would have been as good a, a finished product as it is. All its flaws, you know, notwithstanding. It would have been a lot worse <laughs> had I not spent three years on AuthorTube learning from my peers and, and colleagues. Yeah, there's that. that's, I think, the greatest success of starting this thing early and taking my time with it. I definitely took too long to write the book. I could have done it in probably half the time had I been more disciplined with my writing in the beginning. The first half of those three years, I got very little done compared to the second half. I, most of it was done in that second half of the three years, that, that, that second year and a half. So that's when I really buckled down and got into it. And sure, yeah. Yeah, AuthorTube is a very big part of that. And starting that channel, I mean, it's still growing. I'm actually really excited because today I, I looked at my newsletter and I'm about to crack 300. I'm at 295. And just two weeks ago, I was at 150. So it's taken me three years to get to 150. And in the last two or three weeks, I've nearly doubled that. I've been really cracking down on my newsletter, cracking down on all that kind of stuff. So I'm, I'm seeing results. I'm really excited about it. Start early, work hard, and try not to waste any time. <laughs> Perseverance, that's definitely a big part of just being a writer and then Absolutely. carries over into being an indie author. If that's what you're, the path you're taking, you have to have that perseverance. I would also say that your journey mimics what many authors say in podcasts I listen to, that it take, you know, 10 years for the first book, but the next book took like two years. The next one took like six months. Um, you know, you get faster as you go along. Sure. Sure. Yeah. I, I feel that too. Like right now I haven't really dove into very hardcore yet into the second book. I'm still like in a weird epilogue kind of place with this first book. I'm doing another little edit just to like refine it a little bit, make it a little better of a product now that it's been out a while and people have read it and I've been getting more feedback. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm putting out a, a revised edition in August is my plan, hopefully before the, the convention that I'm going to in August. And then after that, I'm diving headfirst into the, the second book, which right now I I've plotted most of it, you know, in, in outline form, but there's something missing. There's a there's a certain X factor that I haven't quite found for it yet. So I'm, I'm anxious to get back into it and figure that out. But I, I feel like I'm going to get that second book done in half the time of the first book, even if it turns out to be bigger, which I hope it won't. I, I'm trying to <laughs> your first one's already really big. <laughs> trying to keep it at, at the same, at least the same, <laughs> not bigger. All right. So of all of this process, setting up your author platform, getting yourself out there, writing the book besides, you know, trying to write your book faster. If you could do this over, what would you change or what would you have wished you had known? Well, what's funny about that is that I, I, I did know these things, but like you hope for the best. <laughs> so like I, I knew from Jenna Moresi and other creators at the time that this would be a slow process, that it would take time to build, that it's going to take a lot of man hours and hard work and stuff like that. Like they tell you that up front and you're like, yeah, yeah, but I, I, I got it. I got it. And then 
you start doing it and you realize they, they were underselling it. It's a lot of work. It's really hard. I, I have a wife, kids, a day job. I have other things that I need to be doing. And yet I also have to get the writing done. I have to get this, the, you know, the content for YouTube going. I have to be on the social medias. I have to be networking with other authors. I, I have to do all of these things. I have to research marketing. I have to research publishing. I have to, fig, you know, find an artist. I have to, I have to do all these things. The work never ends when you sign up to be an author, you sign up for a lifetime of work, know it and just make your peace with it because it's coming for you. Um, that, so it's not that I would do anything differently or anything like that. I just, I, I wish that I was a little bit more patient uh, because I, I definitely am anxious kind of guy. Like I just, I want to get to the finish line. I want to get to the thing, like let's do it already. And, and those things take time. It takes time to build and get places. So patience. And, and as Shannon said earlier, perseverance, because man, do you get knocked down time and time again uh, as, as an artist of any kind, in this case, a, a, a writer? It's just, it's part of the gig. <laughs> and you know, you say that they, they undersell, that people have undersell what, how much time and stuff. And I, I've thought that before. And I thought, well, I tell people now, and I wonder yeah. if I'm underselling. And I said, you know, I don't think it might be. It's all theory. For, mm. for being an author, it's all theory until you actually start doing it. And then now it's like, oh. Oh, that's well, you know, it's very much akin to pre and post being a parent, because before having kids, you hear parents talk about how it's life changing and everything is different and the, the connection that you have with your kids and talking about all this stuff. And then you have the, the pre parent, right, <laughs> going, well, you know, I have a dog, like I get it. And you're just like, dude, you, you don't get it. And it's not until you actually become a parent that you go, oh, like, this is what they're talking. It's a very much just like that. Like once you actually do the author thing, you realize, oh, these authors are not kidding. This is yeah. freaking nuts in here. Like, <laughs> well, let's shift back to your novel itself. It's a multi-genre story, which includes sci-fi, fantasy, mystery, and romance. And quite some spicy romance at that. But Mythic Shadow of the Spark. In that first video, you talked about making the decision to self-publish versus traditionally publish. You like the creative control, which was one of the main reasons you went with self-publishing. Can you expand on that a little more and what really inspired you to go that route? Well, not to not to sound like a broken record, but we are still talking about that that beginning stages of things. And so, yes, the, the Jenna Moresi influence was heavy in that as well. You know, part of her story is also that she looked into traditional publishing versus uh, indie publishing, self-publishing. She tells this horror story of talking to a particular author who goes unnamed, who is in her later years in life. And she's, you know, so excited to finally be traditionally published after some 30 or 40 years of submitting books and being rejected and never publishing anything until she could get to the traditionally published thing. And that late in life, she's finally published. And Jenna Moresi just thought, and then on top of that, how much money the publisher actually takes and comparing it to her and everything. Like Jenna Moresi just tells that story and she's like, that's it. No traditional publishing. I'm going self-published. And I'm listening to her and I'm looking at the numbers that I'm researching myself. And I'm like, yeah, you're, you're, you're kind of making a pretty good point here. Like, why, why rely so much on them? Like, I get the kind of badge of honor of being traditionally published. That is very alluring even to me. But the idea of being able to craft a work of art that you can call solely your own and put that out into the world. That's something very important to me. Uh, again, I, I consider uh, writing an art form. I consider being an author, being an artist. Those two words are synonymous to me. And this is a work of art that I worked very long on. I chose every word very carefully. I went to the artist and worked on this very, very carefully so that it looks like what I envisioned in my head because it's all one single work of art that I'm putting out into the world. And the last thing I want is some, you know, corporate suit telling me, well, you know, we're going to hire this other cover artist because they have blah, blah, blah. And like, no, like that's, I, I need to be able to make it my own. So yeah, it was traditionally published was publishing was never really an option for me from the very beginning of the, uh, of the research process. I, I knew I, I got to do it myself. Did you have any misconceptions coming into self-publishing besides like, oh, yeah, the amount of work, I, it, I can handle that. Like, it's fine. Did you have any other misconceptions about self-publishing before you started? 
I mean, I suppose that they they stem from that same kind of uh, naive attitude, right? But yeah, just the uh, it kind of goes back to expectations, setting your expectations. Because like, I certainly expected, not expected, I certainly dreamed of selling way more copies in the opening, be a big splash, you know, go viral. Everybody's talking about it on TikTok or whatever. That that stuff doesn't just like happen most of the time. You you have to work for a long time to get there. So, you know, that's that's a pretty big one. Just setting my expectations to realistic standards and, you know, working within the confines of where I'm at. But the dream, I, I always keep that alive, you know. I'm always I'm always shooting for that. So yeah. Expectations, I think, is a big one there. Be realistic about uh, what you're putting out and what you're going to get back. Yeah, I think that's important. I, I think it would be hard to have an expectation to 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 do well with your first book because there are very, very few people who do well with their debut novel because I think we all grow as, as writers. So I can definitely see managing expectations being something important there. Well, you know, every every author tells you your your first book will always be your worst book, or at least it should be because you should always be improving as yeah. a writer. But they also tell you that every book you put out after that first book is meant to sell that first book. You know, like all the sequels are meant to just make people go back to buying that first book. So that's, you know, it's yeah. it's, it's, it's kind of a double-edged sword. <laughs> well, you know, and if I if I thought about a strategy, if I went back in time, like yeah, I did a trilogy because series do better for indie authors because it's how you make your money. But if your first book is not like the best and you're you're growing as an author, then maybe a better strategy would be get a book out, just a book. <laughs> a standalone, right? Yeah. Put out a standalone as your first. And learn what your readers are looking for and what they find that they don't yeah. like or, or what they do you, like. Because <laughs> the first is like the first pancake, right? It's, it's the one right. you throw yeah. away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. From your point of view of having a book out for about three months, it's a little less than three months at this point. What has been your greatest publishing successes so far and what would you attribute it to? I did get a very, very... Uh, nice review from a complete stranger and that was one of the the things that i wanted as a as a sign of succeeding is is somebody that i have absolutely no connection to i didn't you know ask them to buy the book or review it they they bought the book they read it all the way to the end and they wrote a positive review about it and that i mean that's a big one for me um you know marketing in general has has been very trial and error hit or miss learning practice formulating strategy looking at results cursing starting again but those those little author success moments are big for me. Like the, the review was a big one. The uh, the getting accepted into the uh, convention in August was another big one. Like I mean, my name is up in a roster of featured authors, and I'm just like, you know, it probably doesn't mean anything to normal people who walk by it, but to me, I'm like, look, my name is on the thing. So yeah, like I'll, I live for these little like tentpole moments as a as a new author, like my first time doing this or that or the other thing. Like I'm gonna be doing a signing at that convention. That's gonna be my first time doing a signing. That I, I I'm nervous as heck. I've never even done that, but I don't think I can. I, I'm too introverted for it. I'm, so am I, but hey, like we we chose, you know, a profession where we're putting our art out there. Like sometimes you got to sign it. My desk and send it in the mail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I've done that. I think I, I you know, we, we were backstage a little bit before we start recording. I had to walk away, but I thought I heard you saying something when I was coming back that you were selling more books this month than last month. Yeah, my, my sales so far this month, which it's the ninth of the month right now, have already exceeded last month's entire sales. So and, and I've been I've been hitting up my newsletter really hard. My newsletter has grown a lot in the last two weeks, three weeks. Uh, so I'm seeing I'm seeing those results of, of that hard work. I'm putting on a newsletter every week, like clockwork every Friday. And I have newsletter swaps in every single one. I'm just I'm I'm trying to broaden and I and I'm trying to mix it up. I'm trying to hit new audiences with every single newsletter. So working. <laughs> you talked about the emotional roller coaster and particularly the post-launch crash following this debut novel. Do you mind sharing a little bit more about what that experience was like? Yeah, I had a friend, an alum from Livestream Sunday days, who uh, who has published several books and uh, and she even like went through my book. I won't share her name because of what she's sharing but she texts she sent me an email and she was like hey listen your book is about to come out it was like a couple of days away from launch day she's like and i know that a lot of people have given you advice on what to do and what not to do and what to expect but 
a lot of people don't talk about this part. So I just wanted to share with you. And then she starts going into like how difficult it is to, to go through. Like you're writing a high from putting the book out. It's launched. It's a thing. People can actually buy it. You start, you know, you're maybe a couple friends and family start buying copies. You start seeing numbers. You're getting excited. Maybe your marketing plan really worked and you see some real results right away and you're, you're getting really excited. And then things start to dip or to slow or to quiet down and you're hearing crickets and you feel like really like I worked for three years and it's, it's over. Like that's it. Like I just, I put it out and it's over. And no, of course it's not. You're still marketing that book forever now. I mean, I, I imagine actors probably feel something similar whenever, you know, they go to a big movie premiere and the movie comes out and all the reviews come out and then it's like, that's over. Yeah. Like now what? The next one. <laughs> I think I, I told Ben that it, it's about, about the 30 day mark. It's anticlimactic, all your feelings. Yeah. Yeah. So I was grateful for that little warning. Um, it, it hit me nonetheless, but I was grateful for the warning. At least I, I knew what I was going through. <laughs> Are you comfortable discussing any publishing missteps or things you would have liked to have done differently? I mean, I'm comfortable, but <laughs> as, you know, as far as like specifics, it's it's odd because again, it's all a lot of trial and error. Anytime I I try a particular marketing tactic or something, and and I don't see the results that I was hoping for, it's a moment you're like, oh, that didn't work out. But the whole point of even trying it was to see what would happen and learn from that result, and then formulate the next plan. And and since it's always moving, it like. I'm never not marketing this thing. I'm never not working on it in some capacity. So it's just one of those things where um, you can't really pinpoint missteps as much as just learning opportunities. Facebook has been a real tough nut to crack. I just can't seem to get any sales anytime I do Facebook ads. And it feels like I'm just chucking money at Zuckerberg and, and not getting anything back. So I, I'm not playing too much with Facebook these days. I'm kind of doing a little more research and, and trying to come up with something new for over there. Martin, you mentioned his name before, but he also had great success with putting up videos. A video that you've made for both of my books, I've used for the advertising in Facebook and I've seen some returns from that. So you might want to try and combine your own skills that you service out to other people with with your own work. I was I, actually going to say the same thing. Okay. <laughs> and and I am. I'm also trying to do stuff like that for, for TikTok too. I'm blanking on the name of the novel right now, but there's an author on TikTok who has a, a, a novel with a beautiful cover and she is putting out these, you know, short little ads that blow my mind every time. Like she had one where she reaches into, what does she reach into? I want to say it was like, I think, oh no, it's, she's reaching into her actual book. Like her hand goes into the book and pulls out all of the influences of the book. She'll pull out, you know, like a movie that if you like this movie, you'll like this book. She pulls out another book. If you like this book, you'll like this book. She's just like, it, it was crazy. It was like a magic trick. And then she picked up the book and showed the cover and my brain exploded. So I'm trying to come up with cool, interesting, yeah. you know, eye grabbing things like that. that TikTok was cool. made to copy each other. That's what yeah. we're for. So copy her, but do your <laughs> own, do your yeah. own like, pulling out your magic trick. It, yeah. do, do, would you know how to do that? Those I don't things? know how to do that. I asked Martin and he explained it to me and I still don't understand how to do it. Oh, I could, <laughs> I could, maybe I could, but I, cause I think you and I had talked about something that Martin explained to you and I explained it. I didn't know he did it, but you said, Oh, that makes more sense than what Martin said. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. The uh, the, oh, the saturation was, of your the saturation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you and Martin both told me to to lower the saturation on this, and but he just like yelled at me, and then you actually explained how to do it, and I oh like, <laughs> and now it looks better than before. Like it, it was very very bright back here. Yeah. And he was talking about his um. That's the uh prequel. Yes. So this oh. is the short story, and I'm holding up a copy of Mythic, The Death and Rebirth of Bella Erdman. It is a, a short story that serves as a prologue to the main novel. It's just a little too long to put as a prologue in the novel. And uh, and if you buy the print or ebook version, you get three sample chapters from the novel as well. In case you haven't read it, you can kind of wet your whistle on that one. Uh, but you can get the short story by itself without the sample chapters absolutely free by signing up to my newsletter, which should be linked down below. If you could pass on one thing to aspiring self-published writers, what's your best publishing tip or trick? I heard horror stories about Ingram Spark and its similar other companies, and uh, and I was I felt very overwhelmed by how many platforms there are to publish your books on 
And uh, I love condensing things into easy, you know, <laughs> point and click kind of methods. And so for anybody doing it for the first time, this is how I did it for the first time. I used uh, draft to digital draft, the number two digital.com. It's kind of like this massive publishing hub where you can put upload your book once and uh, they even have tools for formatting and putting up the cover and everything. And then they draft to digital publish it to everybody, Amazon, uh, you know, Kobo, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, libraries, they, they publish it or make it available at least to everybody. And then folks can buy it from them. Uh, they also provide you with a universal book link. So you can give people one very easy to read link. And that's going to take them to a page where all the publishers are right there. So if you are an Amazon person, there's an Amazon button. If you're a Barnes and Noble person, there's a Barnes and Noble button. You don't have to worry about hunting it down on the website, searching for it, mistyping the name, not finding it, getting frustrated. You one click and everything is right there. So it makes things very easy for the author. It makes things very easy for the readers to find and to buy. It, it comes with lots of cool little features, like a kind of mini newsletter that alerts people when you publish a new book under their band like it's it's great and very easy to make changes to your product at any time it's i swear by it so far i i, I can't complain at all my only problems with uh publishing have been with amazon uh they, they ran into some trouble publishing the paperback edition but that has since been fixed actually i have to send a, a newsletter out today because i realized yesterday that it's been fixed you can go to amazon and order paperback copies now so i'm i'm paperback right now from Amazon and I couldn't get it. It just kept saying out of stock, out of stock. And I was like, three weeks later, still out of stock. So I ended up buying it from Barnes and Noble. Yeah, that's what most people did. That's what I recommended to most people at the time because I, I didn't know when this Amazon thing was going to work out. And I even contacted draft to digital to see if there was something they could do. And they explained to me, no, this is purely a problem on Amazon side. But what they didn't realize is that it was kind of a widespread, unique new problem that had arise. So uh, in the last couple of weeks, they sent out emails where they realized a lot of our people have complained about this particular problem. So we looked into it. Amazon has some sort of glitch with this particular ISBN batch. It was a 979 uh, prefix number, I believe. So anybody who had a 979 ISBN number, their paperbacks were just not available on Amazon. They just weren't coming up. And so draft to digital and other publishers all reached out to Amazon and nagged at them for a while. And voila, the issue has disappeared and been fixed. So yeah, that's a, uh, maybe another little tip and trick, right? Is you run into a little hiccup like that. You, you gotta, you gotta talk to some, like actually send somebody an email, do something about it because other people might be doing so and the numbers are going to get things done. And it's worthy to note that there are things outside of your control that are going to go wrong. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Like that, like that's a prime example. Most authors make most of their money through Amazon. And up until like a week or two ago, my paperback was not available on Amazon. My book has been published for almost three months, as you said. So yeah, that's something that I had absolutely nothing to do with. It wasn't my fault. Of course, I, I bought a whole batch of 979 ISBN numbers to save money on a. And now I'm like, great, I'm going to run into this with every book now. <laughs> Anyway. Well, hope, hopefully they got resolved now and let's yeah. shift from publishing to marketing we mentioned your youtube channel uh books by adrian and we've also kind of hinted at some of the other marketing that you've done for your book but do you want to elaborate on anything in particular i'm trying a little bit of everything really the only platform i'm not on at all is twitter because it's just a hurricane in there and i can't make heads or tails out of anything i don't want to scream into the void i'm dipping my toe pretty much everywhere else i've got stuff going on on instagram i got stuff going on on facebook TikTok. I have my website, of course, uh, where, you know, like, for example, I sell signed and, you know, personalized copies of the paperback through my Kofi. You can buy them directly from me and I'll ship them out myself after I sign them. So I have windows everywhere for people to like find be like, oh, check this out. And, and it all draws you to the are book. You, are you on threads? I'm not on threads. <laughs> I didn't even know what that was until Richard started talking about it. Recently. Richard Holiday started talking about it recently. No, no, I'm not on threads yet. I also heard there's something called Hive, but it's very quickly just becoming porn. So, because uh, <laughs> apparently they, they let you post whatever. So, yeah, let's not promote that here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, platforms popping up all over the place. I don't, I don't, I, I, 
I don't know. I can't join them all, but I'm but I'm on a bunch of them. And as I said before, Facebook is is pretty challenging. And honestly, I don't see very many sales from Instagram either. But I I have seen some sales from TikTok for sure. I and uh, and YouTube. I have traced several sales back to just folks finding my YouTube channel and then going and ending up somewhere in my newsletter and sending me how they stumbled upon me and now they're buying books and it's just it's it's wild. And I have like now friends and family who ordered through Amazon and the paperback and didn't get it from way back then all of a sudden are starting to get it now so people i didn't know had bought it friends who i didn't know would read it are starting to read it It, it's it's i don't know it feels like a a second launch in a way it's weird you won the lottery yeah no no, i don't know about that (laughs) i'd like to with your book being multi-genre has that affected how you might market your book versus if it was only one genre and how yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the uh, one of the people that I learned a lot from was is a gentleman named David Gogren. He has his own course on marketing and, and publishing a book. And one of the things that that he really struck a chord with me with was where uh, people who have a multi genre book feel like they're at a disadvantage because people who adhere to a certain genre will tell you, well, you have to now find your niche and market directly to that one niche and just bombard them with marketing. Whereas a multi-genre writer is like, well, what's my niche? And David Gogren's point is that you have more than one. If you have more than one genre, you have more than one niche to reach out to. And it does not mean that you are being less specific. You're being just as specific as the other guy, but you got to do it three times instead of just once. So I I have a very strong uh, focus marketing on sci-fi readers, letting them know that this is a sci-fi world. And then I feel like most sci-fi Sci-fi readers know that sci-fi is a broad enough uh, a genre that you can tell it's different kinds of plots within that genre, and so they'll welcome hopefully a, a murder mystery plot set in a sci-fi world. You know, and I'm marketing to fantasy fans, letting them know, hey, this is a sci-fi world, but it's got fantasy elements, and you're going to find your magic and your weird little creatures that you like. They're all in here, so that's going to attract them as well. And I feel like there's a kinship between fantasy and sci-fi, even though it seems like polar opposite. It's, there's two sides of the same coin in a lot of ways. And I feel like those two can play together more so than other genres. And then, you know, I can market directly to the murder mystery people and be like, hey, this particular murder mystery takes place in space. Weird. Come and figure this one out. And so I can market to these niches and be as specific as I need to be to find whoever's going to buy the books. But I can do that several times. And that's just reaching more people. That's the plan anyway. So I always thought that it's not really a disadvantage when you have multi-genre works because now you have, like, say for you, you have three different audiences, which means you have three chances at getting someone's attention. So I kind of look at it that way. And then there's this idea, and it was noted by an author who wrote a book a couple decades ago where he first noted this, and he has a new book that just came out, but he's talking about this, this cross-genre is where we're heading in today's world. And it all started with Star Wars, but just sci-fi fantasy. And the idea is that when we cross these genres, we we tap into something that's new that we haven't seen in the market. And of course, you know, people always like new stuff. And, and so, that, you know, for instance, I'm now writing in fantasy romance, which is a cross genre. And that has been a genre that has been growing exponentially over the last few years. So I, I think it's a smart move. Personally, I, I there could be probably something said, and, and I remember this author said, that there really is a max of how many genres you should cross. And I think he said no more than three, but he said it does better when it's just two. John Truby. Yes, John Truby is the name of the author. I knew it was John and I was like true something, but I didn't remember the name. Thank you for finding that. I read something by John John Truby. I can't remember what it is now, but as as soon as you said the the, the name with such excitement, I was like, I have read something from it. Yeah, people forget that Star Wars is a a sci-fi fantasy. You know, Mm -hmm. You, you have your lasers and... Your spaceships but you also have wizards that move stuff with their mind so yeah the force <laughs> that's all yeah. magic. That's magic um well has there been any marketing you've tried that didn't seem to work so far yeah I, again the facebook yeah. thing yeah, yeah. face fa- yeah I, I, I can't i can't figure that one out but i'm, I'm also not alone and trying to figure it out. I, I got a couple of buddies who are helping me out and, and they're doing their research and I got a marketing guy in, in that team and we're going to try and crack this this whole Facebook thing. But yeah, you know, the trailer is definitely going to be a big part of that. But nowadays things are, are also focused more on like short, you know, content, YouTube shorts and TikTok shorts and all that kind of stuff. So we're trying to kind of find a, a nice balance. Going off on that one short detail, if you could pass on one thing to an aspiring self-published writer, What's your best marketing tip or trick? 
know that you know nothing and ask everybody questions and learn from everybody. Try things. Don't get too emotionally attached to the sales numbers, at least not, you know, especially not in the beginning, I guess. It's it's a business. You, you got to be a little cold about it sometimes because it can bum you out when you try so many things, especially when you're putting money into it. Ads cost money. And so you are essentially gambling a little bit because you can listen to every expert that there is about marketing and you can listen to every dude who you know feels like they've cracked the code because it worked for them and and maybe it will work for you and you should definitely try it you should definitely try everything that sounds like a good idea to you when it doesn't work for you don't be too discouraged try to learn from what didn't work try to find ways to make those aspects better to try different variations on the idea and again trial and error trial and error even you know trends change people's tastes change you know authors get canceled and <laughs> like who knows what the you know the 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 marketplace is going to look like in a couple of years so it's always going to be changing you're always going to be learning you're always going to be trying again and again and uh, sometimes you will have great great successes and sometimes you're going to throw money and not get any back and you just got to got to take that on the chin like a boxer and just keep on going man so we're going to switch over to talking about your writing life and your works. So what made you want to start writing? Uh, I've always been a writer of some kind. I've, I've written many different kinds of things. You know, when I was in high school, I, I was in, you know, little punk rock bands and stuff. So I wrote songs. I was always a big reader. I loved reading ever since I think like second grade, I think it is when it really cracked. I just had a, a, a teacher who the way that she read was I don't know. It's just like the vibration was perfect. And I was like, oh, reading is amazing. Let me get into that. And before I knew it by, you know, by seventh, sixth or seventh grade, I was reading Michael Crichton novels and talking to my history teacher about those. And, and it just changes something in you when you fall in love with storytelling. And so sometimes I, I thought I was going to write movies or TV shows and I tried my hand at scripts. I'm not very good at scripts. It's not a format that I excel at yet. Prose has been way more welcoming to me. And, and that makes sense with what I was writing in, in when I was a kid, you know, just little tiny stories here and there. And I would make little comic books a lot. I'm not a very good artist, but I would draw funny little comics and create little stories with them. So I've always been a storyteller in some form or another. For me anyway, when I wasn't using that particular talent or passion in, in any healthy way, it could become very destructive. I would become a storyteller in personal exchanges and that's not good you shouldn't just be making shit up when you're talking to people sorry <laughs> um anyway uh so i it, i have funneled all of that energy into storytelling and writing stories and uh I, i'm much happier now than ever before just being able to put words on a page it's it's therapy so yeah i'm glad you mentioned that you're in a happy place which means we're not getting any stories right now right <laughs> no, I mean, you, I mean, true stories. Sure. <laughs> They're still technically stories. <laughs> yes. So um, what does your typical writing life look like? I think you already said that you, you kind of outline and stuff, but do you, do you plan to write for a set period of time every day? And I know you said you're also a, you have a job full time. You've got your, your, your family. So what does that, that look like for you? Yeah. Funnily enough, I cover a lot about this in in the uh, author tube writing conference talk that I did, but uh, yeah, I have a, a set amount of time that I have to work every day. Nowadays, right now, it's not writing, writing, writing. It's more the author stuff. Like I have a certain amount of time today to do this, to do some marketing for the book, to create some animations for the channel, or plan what the show I'm doing on Tuesday is things like that. I set my timers, I get work done. I have a reward system so that I'm, you know, I'm not allowed to touch my video game until all the work is done, that kind of thing. And once all this work is done, uh, after the conference or the convention rather in August, when I dive into writing book two, it's going to be like that every day. I have a set amount of time that I have to write. It doesn't matter necessarily how many words I get down each day. It just matters that during that allotted time, I did nothing else but write and you get, you get it done. Just put in your time for the day, clock in, clock out, do it again the next day. I try to do that every day with weekends off. You know, I, I, I decide what Saturday and Sunday is in the week and, and maybe I don't do writing that day. Maybe I just read those days. But uh, whatever it is, I have a lot of time each day. 
as you mentioned, I'm, I'm busy. I got a family. I have a day job. But you can always make time if, if you have to get up a little earlier in the morning to do some writing before the family wakes up. If that means going to bed an hour earlier, then go to bed an hour earlier. You know, if that means skipping out on your favorite show, well, you know, everybody's got a DVR these days. Just catch it a little later on the replay. Use it as your reward for getting your work done the next day. Whatever it is you need to do, you can you can get it done. You know, come at it as a professional. Pretend that you're clocking in and clocking out and make sure that you get your work done. What are you working on next? Are you jumping right to the sequel to Mythic or are you working on some of the short stories like you mentioned, the uh, birth and death of Bella Erdman? And so, when are you planning on getting the sequel out? So uh, so right now I'm working on the new edit for the novel. After that comes out, uh, it should be around the same time as the convention in August. After that's done, before I dive into the next novel, I am going to finish up some of these short stories. I have five short stories that I'm going to put out in a little collection type dealie uh, next year. But in the meantime, I'll put them out through the newsletter and get some beta readers going and get some critique partners going and then put them together in a nice collection next year. And then hopefully the year after that will be the next book coming out. So I want to get a book out every two years from now on. Yeah, that makes complete sense to me. And that is a really good timeline to be, especially given how thick some of those books are. They're chunky. And we want to do something a little, we want to shake up this interview. So we're going to do some rapid fire questions if you're ready to go. Do you right. in? Yeah, I'm in. Awesome. <laughs> What comes first for you, the characters, the setting, or the plot? Characters. I may have ideas for setting and plot first, but nothing happens until a character becomes fully formed in my mind and becomes a person and starts walking around and talking. Like that's that's when the story becomes a story for me. I can have a million plot ideas, but if I don't care about the character, it's not it's not happening. I have some short stories that I was working on for that collection that I just like I've just left them halfway through because I'm like, I don't care about this character. You know, maybe I'll come back and try it again with a different one, but this, this one ain't it. It's not, it's, you know. And sorry, Adrian, these are rapid fire questions. So you want to answer? Sorry. It's a little easier moving forward. So Morgan, what do you yeah. got? Got it. All right. I'll, I'll fire them faster. <laughs> okay. Morning writer or night writer? Uh, I want to be a night writer, but I'm a morning writer. I do my best work in the morning. Planner, pantser, or plantser? Plantser-ish. More, more planner, but, you know, leaning more planner, but, but I, I discover during the writing as well. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Tea is just brown water. It's gross. <laughs> it's all brown water. <laughs> um, complete the sentence. The best thing about writing is... Creating worlds that didn't exist before. First thought when you got your first one star review. Um, uh, was that it? Right there? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I it was it, shocking, I guess, but shouldn't have been. But it was. I don't know. It wasn't. It wasn't pleasant. It was a hard one for me. Favorite television series. Breaking Bad. Favorite read book. American Gods by Neil Gaiman. Complete the sentence. When I got my first unsolicited positive review from a complete stranger, I... I bumped chest with the first male I ran into. <laughs> Love that. Favorite character from your debut novel? Faye. She's, she's my favorite character, but uh, I, I have a soft spot for Migdalia as well. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you have answered all of our questions. Before we wrap Not very up, quickly. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> no, we, we like hearing you talk. We like having this back and forth. And I never explained the rules, so it's on me. <laughs> before we wrap up, please tell our listeners where they can find you and purchase your books and possibly your YouTube channel. Uh, the easiest place to find everything is booksbyadrian.com. You can get to my YouTube from there. You can get to my uh, book from there, to the book trailer from there, to my blog, to my newsletter. Everything is right there. So booksbyadrian.com for all your books by Adrian needs, including the channel and all those things. But uh, it's easy to find me anywhere you go because it's always books by Adrian. The only one that's slightly different is Instagram. There's underscores between books and by and Adrian. But uh, yeah, otherwise, very easy to find. Well, since stream is owned by Instagram and it's all under the meta headline, I assume that you'll have to do underscores for that as well. I, I think, I don't think I have underscores on the Facebook, which oh, I think what? it's, yeah, I think it's if all scratched into Instagram one word. To, it flows yeah. from Instagram too. So. Yeah, the, the new platform threads from Instagram, yeah. 
So okay. if you do connect your uh, connect a Threads account to your when you do that, it automatically connects to your Instagram account. So if you ever want to get rid of your Threads account, it also deletes your Instagram account. Okay, I'm just not gonna mess with Threads. I, I, <laughs> I'm just gonna yeah. just gonna stay away from that. Yeah. <laughs> sounds terrible. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for joining us today and giving us your insight and experience, and just hanging out because it's always fun talking to you. Yeah. Uh, it's always a pleasure with you guys, all three of you. This, this was great, fantastic. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Honor and a privilege. <laughs> and Honor thanks. and a privilege. Both. Thank you so much to all of our listeners and viewers. We really appreciate you joining us. And August 1st, we'll be talking to Bethany Votal about ghost writing and how it impacts her writing life. Bye, everyone. Bye.